Okay, so uh, the topic for today is gonna be intro to Ruby in the browser. Uh, my name is Andy Malley. I'm a senior software engineer at Lexop. Uh, and I'm gonna be giving this presentation today for uh, the Montreal RB Ruby meetup. So uh, before I get into the topic, let's first watch a video of Matt, the creator of Ruby, uh, giving a keynote speech at RubyConf uh, 2022 and talking about the idea of Ruby in the browser. First of all, the Ruby is available on the WASM, so the WebAssembly. So the, the whole Ruby, compiled, uh, Ruby virtual machine can be compiled into the, the WebAssembly so that the, you can run the full, full Ruby, uh, any restriction uh, in, in the browser so that uh, that is that is quite wonderful. So the when I got this proposal from the community, I I just thought that you know, it was it could be a yet another platform of the, the that Ruby supports. Uh, for example, Ruby is run in Linux and uh, FreeBSD and Windows, Mac OS, and uh, and and uh, AIX from uh, IBM. And then many platforms. Now we, I thought we got yet another platforms. But uh, uh, the WASM is more than that because the we can run full Ruby in in browser, so that uh, maybe we can replace the you know replace the JavaScript by totally Ruby. Not the you know, but not by emulation, not by the you know, the hiding something. You know, fully uh, implemented Ruby in the browser. That is kind of you know game game changing. Yeah, Ruby on Now, uh, the Endo san, which is who is in charge of the you know many things like a pro, um, I prof and uh, you know the many games and. Uh, uh, the after carrot and then, and then he also played with the Ruby Wasm and then he made some kind of the, you know uh, interactive Ruby environment in browser so that all Ruby program in, will be run on the browser so that you don't have to worry about the you know the sandboxing and the, you know the set uh, the protecting execution in the, in the server side or something like that. So that was it for his uh, segment on uh, Ruby in the browser. So next I'm gonna show you the Ruby playground that he was talking about. Uh, the Ruby website actually has a new pr playground uh, called uh, Try Ruby. So let me get out of the slides and show you an example of it. So there it is. You can navigate to it from rubylang.org and it gives me the full Ruby runtime run in the browser. So for example, if I say three times print welcome, meaning print welcome three times for us, I'm gonna run it and it shows us welcome, welcome, welcome. That was run in the browser. It was not run on a server. It did not send those inst instructions to a backend server, process them and come back. It processed them right away in the browser using Ruby by running uh, via WASM, which is WebAssembly. Uh, so WASM is this new technology that enables you to compile any programming language into binary instructions that can be understood by web browsers and run within a sandboxed environment in a web browser. And Ruby took advantage of it recently and released a, a Ruby version that's fully compiled for WASM. So uh, let's play around with the example a bit just to demonstrate it better with uh, more variations. So I, I'm, I'm just gonna try to include this n variable that usually you get from the times uh, iterator and put it in uh, welcome. And I'm gonna change the print into a puts. So this is just demonstrating that, you know, it's not a pre-programmed response. It's actually Ruby. I changed the program and it actually did something else now. Welcome zero, welcome one, welcome two. Uh, I can, for example, uh, like if I don't want to start from zero, I can say welcome one, two, three. So, I mean, this is a, a, a very good example of uh, using Ruby in the browser, 
but usually you want to go beyond that and implement your own Ruby methods. So how do we do that? So I'm going to open another tab that has the try Ruby playground uh, with an enlarged uh, uh, box and that fits a whole method. And I'm going to show you a method that basically if I give it a price quantity hash, meaning a hash that is mapping, so there's the hash, it's mapping uh, prices for products into quantities. So it's saying I have uh, five products that cost $10, four products that cost three, three that cost 20, two that cost 100. Uh, now I'm going to ask it to execute this calculate total method uh, and it's going to do a reduce using the Ruby iterator uh, reduce. It's going to reduce the hash into a single number. Uh, so that's what reduce means and it's going to basically multiply the prices by the quantities in the hash. So if I were to uh, now go here and run it and see it gave me 322. It gave me the correct number for the calculation of the order total for products. Now suppose I want to upgrade the solution and use classes, Ruby classes. I can actually upgrade the solution. Uh, what I'm going to do is copy code that I prepared beforehand. Uh, that will upgrade the solution into an object-oriented solution. So now I'm going to use object-oriented classes. Not only do you get the basic classes of Ruby, but you also get struct, which we're all very familiar with from Ruby. Uh, struct is a quick way of uh, having you know, a data bag of properties. So I have a price, I have a quantity, and that represents an order item. Uh, but then also I can build an order that will be initialized with order items. Uh, it'll store them in an instance variable. And then when I call calculate total, it's going to use the exact same algorithm we used before, except in an object-oriented way, because it's going to work with order item objects, uh, calling price and quantity, and then uh, it'll give us the total. So now if I build an order items array, and I pass it to order, and I call calculate total, so let's uh, run this again. It's going to give me the same number, but I mean to prove that it's uh, doing something, I'm gonna change the program a bit. See, it says total and then 322. So it, it ran basically a Ruby class in a struct using the same familiar Ruby APIs that we're used to in the browser. Uh, but not only that, this is uh, one way of running Ruby in the browser, uh, which is by using WASM, WebAssembly. There is a second way of Ruby, running Ruby in the browser, which is called Opal Ruby. Uh, so if I were to go back to the original try Ruby playground, I can switch here to Opal and that's a JavaScript transpiler of Ruby. So instead of being a web assembly uh, implementation of Ruby, this is a JavaScript implementation of Ruby. Uh, it's, it's a transpiler will basically convert Ruby source code to JavaScript source code automatically and then run it in the browser. This exact same program will run the same way now using Opal Ruby. So if I were to, uh, let's change it a bit. Uh, let's just say it puts N here. So it's going to say it puts N, zero, and then welcome one, one, and welcome two, two, and welcome three. If I were to remove this change, just to prove that it gives me the same result as before, there you go, welcome one, welcome two, welcome three. Uh, same here. I can also uh, run an entire class using Opal. So Ruby Lang gives us both options to play around with. So I can run it and it gives me a same, the same exact answer. So, so now that I've gone through a full a demo of what you could do with Ruby in the browser, that proves that you have the full Ruby capabilities in the browser, let's jump into another topic. So why Ruby in the browser? Why, why should we consider using Ruby in the browser? Uh, first of all, it's to improve developer productivity with an isomorphic application architecture that enables using the same programming language on both the front end and back end to minimize friction and maximize flow and creative problem solving. Meaning if developers, uh, an isomorphic application architecture means you're using the same programming language on both the server and the client. So both the back end and the front end. And uh, by doing so, developers don't have to do too much context switching between multiple programming languages. They will, we will minimize fraction for the way they're solving problems and will maxim maximize their flow and creativity uh, of solving problems by using one language on both the front end. So you have a front end Ruby here on the browser and you have back end Ruby in the cloud. Uh, next, uh, we want to significantly, uh, sorry, Ruby has significantly better front end code readability and maintainability 
via Ruby's unique syntax features like blocks and operator overloading. So JavaScript does not support either of those two features. Blocks are not available in JavaScript. They do give you anonymous functions, but they're not as nice as blocks. And uh, they're not as, they're too verbose. They're not as uh, readable as blocks. And then operator overloading is not supported either. But Ruby gives you the ability to op over overload operators, for example. And here I'm building a message from metadata, header, body, footer. So by combining four objects, I'm getting a, four, uh, a new object called a message. And that's by op uh, overriding this operator, this uh, double arrow uh, operator. Uh, and then here, this is a demonstration of blocks. I can like say to the message, handle the event sent. And when the event happens, I just open a block. I don't have to pass an anon anonymous function. This is a much nicer syntax. I say do uh, validate the message and then deliver it and then end. And then here I can build a summary by uh, mapping the messages to their subject and then joining them. Uh, so the Ruby syntax is significantly better for front end code readability and maintainability. Uh, next, uh, JavaScript in general is an awful and confusing programming language with very verbose syntax in spite of all the modern ECMAScript releases. Even today, I have to write code like this to uh, do a very big, like, sorry, uh, like a multi-step processing of data in order to uh, go from people to uh, people grouped by their first names um, with some filters in between. And Ruby is just this. It's a lot shorter. I can write a lot less code and do the same thing in Ruby because it gives you compact. It gives you map with, a, with the ampersand select with the ampersand, uh, so it's, and it gives you a group by method. So it's, Ruby's still a lot nicer than JavaScript. There's no denying that. Uh, next, uh, Ruby's ability to build declarative internal DSLs, meaning domain-specific languages, to write lightweight front-end GUI code that can mix logic unobtrusively, adopting a one-language approach instead of the confusing mix of JavaScript and HTML or JSX or templates like mustache templates, is a lot simpler. This is Ruby code that can generate HTML. It is super simple. It's less code than writing the HTML directly or writing JSX. Uh, and you can mix in logic with it directly without opening a scriptlet. So unlike uh, in, uh, whether in, in ERB or JSX, you have to open scriptlets or, or do stuff or mix in weird parentheses. Here, you, you are in, in native Ruby, whether you're building HTML elements or whether you're building or you're adding some logic like an if statement or an iterator. And here's an example of like a DSL that is used uh, in Ruby to generate HTML. So you write this code in Ruby, it's all in Ruby. It gives me this HTML and it's, it's a very uh, efficient way of generating HTML in one language, mixing both logic and structure unobtrusively. Uh, use JavaScript libraries from Ruby with enhanced Ruby code, having higher readability, maintainability, and flexibility. So this is an example of using jQuery from Ruby in the, in the browser. So instead of saying, uh, so we say document ready, a document ready, uh, on ready of the document, do this stuff. And then here, uh, instead of using dollar, the jQuery API in Ruby uses element, and it's more readable, it's more English, it's more, <coughs> understandable and then I can use standard Ruby iterators with it like reject and select uh, and mix them up with jQuery and it's just a lot more readable than jQuery code directly in JavaScript. Uh, reuse some Ruby gems on the front end. I've been able to actually use several, several Ruby gems uh, on the front end. Uh, so you could do that with Ruby in the browser. Uh, Ruby has better core APIs than JavaScript, like the APIs for array, hash, enumerable, string, symbol. In general, they're nicer than the, the APIs in JavaScript. Uh, Ruby's metaprogramming facilities are superior to those of JavaScript. Like you can have nice DSLs like this uh, RSpec DSL for you know, describing an application and saying before, subject, it does this, it returns success, etc. It's a very nice DSL. Things like that are only possible in Ruby. Like, uh, are you running SPEC in the browser? Um, th that was an example of demonstrating that you could do that in Ruby if you want. Okay. There is a, a version of RSpec in the browser, yes, for Opal. Um, save development time by sharing, reusing Ruby code between the front end and the back end. This is a very big one. If I have a, a class called Price Calculator that has a certain algorithm for calculating taxes, 
uh, in the back end. I can use it in the back end Ruby, like on the, in the cloud, or I can use it now in the front end Ruby to calculate uh, taxes immediately, instantly in the browser without having to go to the back end and then come back to the front end. Uh, transfer developers Ruby skills from the back end to the front end. So, I mean, there are a lot of developers that are very well uh, skilled in Ruby on Rails and ERB and stuff like that. Uh, so they, they have done a flavor of front end using ERB. Now they can do it in Ruby on the front end directly. They don't have to rely on something like ERB. So the same developer that's basically a back end Ruby developer can now be a Ruby developer on the front end too. Okay, so now that I've gone through uh, all the reasons for why to consider Ruby in the browser, let's talk about the available options and trade-offs uh, for Ruby in the browser. So fortunately, there are newer technologies that enable running Ruby code in the browser nowadays. So let's talk about them. So the first one is Ruby Wasm. That's the one that Matt's mentioned in his keynote speech at RubyConf 2022. So it's a WebAssembly binary that runs in the browser. It supports Ruby 3.2, you know, the, the newest Ruby. Uh, you require JS to access the DOM. So it does give you access to the DOM of the browser, like the HTML DOM. Uh, you just require the JS library and you get access to it. I'll show you examples of that in a moment. Uh, it has native Ruby data structures like string or array. Uh, the security is sandbox security. So Ruby Wasm has sandbox security, meaning you cannot run code that will access the files of the system hosting the browser uh, because you are inside a sandbox. So it is very secure. It downloads all of Ruby. Uh, so I will get the entirety of Ruby when I first hit the, web, the website that is hosting it. Uh, it's about 10 megabytes uh, total for downloading Ruby and about three megabytes compressed. Now, uh, let's go into the second option. The second option is Opal Ruby. That's a JavaScript transpiler instead of a WebAssembly binary. It also supports Ruby 3.2, the newest Ruby. So you, you get the newest Ruby, Ruby whether you want to use Opal or Wasm. Uh, this one gives you access to the DOM using a, a, a library called uh, Native. However, Opal Ruby uh, takes a shortcut. They do not recreate all of Ruby's data structure, structures from scratch. What they do is they hook into JavaScript's data structures directly. So when I'm using a string in Opal, I'm using the JavaScript string. But they do add to it all the methods that are required by a string API in Ruby, of course. So you still can write Ruby code on top of it. Uh, it has all the security of JavaScript, so you're not limited by security. It has good security. Uh, it, so one big, big selling point for Opal over Wasm is that it only downloads what is used of Ruby. So if I only use a very tiny part of Ruby, like just the puts, which will, uh, puts will translate to console, console log, it'll only give me that in the JavaScript compiled uh, uh, downloadable file. It, so that means, if I go next, it's kilobytes, not megabytes. So instead of getting 10 megabytes of Ruby, it's only about, well, part of the reason also is because it's hooking to a lot of JavaScript functionality that's already there. So instead of 10 megabytes, it's only half a megabyte. Like, it's only 458 kilobytes compressed, about 103K kilobyte compressed. Um, by the way, those numbers, I got them from a guy who's experimented with both Ruby Wasm and Opal Ruby, and he gave me those numbers. Uh, but also the 10 megabyte number, I confirmed it myself in the browser. Might have been 9.7, so that's why it says here approximately. So, uh, so that's, that's where I got those numbers. But the benefit of Opal Ruby is it'll only download what's needed. So then the website will load much faster with Opal Ruby, meaning Ruby Wasm is probably better for things that are, uh, if you need to build an application that's very big and uh, it really needs all of Ruby somehow, maybe then you'll consider Ruby Wasm for some reason. But if you don't need that, you're just building basic web applications, I think Opal Ruby should work better most of the time, especially for performance characteristics. Uh, any questions before I go further? When does the Ruby get transpiled? Sorry, every client request or before no. I... No, uh, uh, it, it gets pre-compiled as far as I know on deployment of the server to production, if I'm not mistaken. So by the time that people are hitting the website, 
if I'm not mistaken, it's already compiled. But in development, in the development environment, it does comp compile on request because it needs to give you the ability to troubleshoot your applications and debug them. So only in development, as far as I know, it, it compiles instant, uh, immediately, but in, on production, from what I remember, it should be pre-compiled. The client is downloading JavaScript. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, Visual Studio Code debugging, is that possible with some kind of remote connector to Opal? Yes, so Opal provides, a, uh, supports a feature called, uh, a browser feature, sorry, a web browser feature called Source Maps that map ja uh, Ruby code into, uh, 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 sorry, effects in the browser from what that Ruby code is doing. So that way if I'm debugging, I can debug and it would step through Ruby code, not through JavaScript code. So that way I can debug Ruby code directly in the browser. But not using Visual Studio code. Uh, sorry, so I'm talking about source maps, which runs in Chrome in the browser yeah, itself. So there's a Visual Studio code uh, extension for Chrome to allow you to do that for development. It considers that okay, I personally don't use VS code, so I couldn't answer your question just because I don't use that. I use my own editor, <laughs> so yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, does Opal Ruby get better? Because you, you expected it to, you know, if it's seeing the JavaScript directly, the browser will, like, the performance in the browser will be pretty good. Well, using Ruby last time, you'd imagine that, like, the browser is just executing an entire right. interpreter. Right. 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 And so it can't jit over the Ruby code. Right, right. The Ruby WASM is almost exactly like the C interpreter that runs on your machine. So um, to answer your question, I think. In theory, the JavaScript implementation should be faster, but you know what? I could be wrong, actually. Wasm is known to have faster performance than JavaScript in general, but, but in my experience, I felt no difference between the two. Uh, for main apps, I'm not running high, highly intensive numerical algorithms. I'm just doing basic calculations like I showed you guys, or like order total or tax or stuff like that. For that stuff, there's no difference, really. Uh, it's not a very long running program. Right. Uh, but, but if it's something very intensive in its calculations, there might be some difference. But to be honest, in that case, maybe you shouldn't use Ruby. You should use a different Wasm language because Wasm supports C as well. Okay. So, yeah. When you change, sorry, when you're setting changes to binary, should you expect the C speed or Ruby speed? Um, because binary, I, I think it should be compiled to something that can be binary. Then right, know, right. It should be comparable to Ruby. Because Ruby is running on C as well, on, the, on your desktop machine. So it is very comparable to it, as far as I know. The, 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 the reason I'm expecting a difference, because Ruby... I have not seen per, uh, benchmarks. Uh, okay. So I, 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 maybe you should go and Google some benchmarks okay. in case somebody ran some. Uh, but in my experience, I didn't feel any slowdowns in either option. Uh, no, no, no compatibility issues. In my experience, zero, zero compatibility. They're very compatible because uh, all browsers nowadays, as far as I know, are, are compatible, like uh, Safari, Edge, and uh, Chrome are very compatible with Wasm. And obviously they're compatible with JavaScript too, so both run very well. And both of them obviously also are much faster than sending a request to a server and getting a response back. Like running anything in JavaScript, sorry, in Opal Ruby or what Ruby Wasm in the browser is much faster than sending a, a server request and getting a result back. So that's a huge improvement. Uh, okay, so let's go next. So how do we get started with Ruby in the browser? Uh, that is one of the main questions that are being answered by this presentation today, because the name of the presentation is Intro to Ruby in the Browser. So um, first of all, let's start with Ruby Wasm. So I'd like you all to please star this project on GitHub. Uh, to learn more about it, go to github.com, Ruby, Ruby Wasm. I'm gonna click it just for a second, uh, just so I could um, give you a quick idea of the project. So there it is, Ruby Wasm. It gives you a very quick here introduction of how to use it in the browser. Uh, and then here it gives you other examples of how to use it for desktop purposes. So Wasm can be used as a sandbox environment on the desktop as well. It doesn't just run in the browser. So it could be used for packaging your app in a cross-platform way as a Ruby app and running it on both on Mac, Windows, and Linux uh, using a sandboxed environment. So it has other benefits. Uh, they call that WASI 
Uh, but anyways, uh, that's about it as far as checking out the website. So uh, let's look more into just a second. Okay, so uh, let's get started with a quick tutorial on how to get started. So add this HTML to the head of a Rails layout. So simply, they have this pre-compiled version of Wasm that they will give you to download as a JS script using a script tab. It's that easy. You just add this to your layout and boom, you're ready with the Wasm. This will download all of uh, Ruby and Wasm, which is about 9.7 megabytes or so. Next, uh, add this HTML to a Rails layout or a Rails view. Basically, it's just a script tag, and now you can use text Ruby as a, as a real browser language. So, so just like how you use JavaScript script tags, you say text uh, JavaScript or whatever types JavaScript, now you can say type text Ruby, which is awesome, and then you can pass it a Ruby script. So I can just pass it wasm example.rb which is off of my website, hosted on my website. Go, uh, sorry, you have a question? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to point out that that script will be cached. So the first time you take down. Yes, it, yes. It'll be there forever right. after, until right. after the next version. Right. And so the second time after, it'll go boom. Right, which, which is, could be good enough with certain website requirements, and it could be bad for other website requirements. If, the kind, if it's the kind of website where you need a user to land only once ever in their lifetime, you don't want it to be a slow website, so this wouldn't work well enough. You would need Opal Ruby for that. But if it's a website that is an, a highly complicated, like uh, auto, AutoCAD kind of application that employees use every day, then yes, the first time they visit it, they'll download 10 megabytes. The next time, it doesn't matter. Does so yes, I agree website? with you. It could be from anybody. So if, yeah, if, if it's like a CDN. If this, that's right, it is a CDN. So mm -hmm. anybody, if yes. anybody's writing Ruby, Right, so this is a content delivery network. Uh, that's what CDN means, meaning it's an accelerated uh, ser server for hosting uh, static content. So that, that means this will download as fast as possible, but it's still 10 megabytes. So as, you, as they always say in software engineering, you have to start with the requirements first in mind. It depends on the requirements. Uh, do you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, I'm just pointing out that that means if you go to multiple websites, they all use the same version of Ruby Wasm. If, if they have the same exact version and the same exact URL, you are correct. If it's a different URL, then every website will have its own download uh, imp uh, penalty. Okay, so let's go next. So after that, you can uh, add some you know, basic markup to your Rails view. So I added a button. I added uh, an H1 um, like header message container. And finally, I can add Ruby code. So I'll add it to in a Rails app under public Wasm example. So it can just go directly into public. There's nothing that's gonna happen to it in sprockets in the back end. So here I'm just adding basic Ruby code. Require JS uh, puts, this is Ruby in the browser, and then grab document from JavaScript. So doc, this is the exact same document you have access to in JavaScript. So you use JS global, which is from the JS library. I can grab window as well. And then finally, I can say get element by ID. So the same exact JavaScript APIs are available for you in Ruby. Uh, and then here I can grab a button. And then I can add an event listener for the click of the button, which is the equivalent of adding on click, the on click event on a button in HTML. And then I build the message and I put it in the message container. And then I, I can say window alert in the same message. So let's demonstrate how this works in practice. So I mean, if I were to load the page, I'm gonna get this in the browser console. It's gonna give me the Ruby version that it loaded, and then it's gonna say this is Ruby in the browser. Next, I'm gonna see this button in the web page, in the browser web page. Uh, it's gonna say click to see a message. So when I click it, I will get this uh, alert from the window. Welcome to Ruby Wasm. And next, it's going to load the header, the H1 element, with Welcome to Ruby Wasm. So let's see a real version of it next. So I'm going to load a real version of it now. There it is. I already have it loaded. Let me maximize it a bit. So if I click here, it says Welcome to Ruby Wasm, as you can see. And if I hit OK, it loaded the H1 element, Welcome to Ruby Wasm. And then if I open the console, and uh, let's, just, let's go to the console. See, it says this is Ruby in the browser, and here it gives me the Ruby version. So this is a full demonstration in a Rails app 
of uh, Ruby wasn't working in the browser. Um, I know that Opal Ruby supports source maps, so I can actually look at the Ruby code in the browser for Opal Ruby. Mm -hmm. For Wasm, I don't have enough experience to know the answer to that question, but I, I have read somewhere that Wasm does support, uh, or sorry, there are implementations of Wasm for other programming languages like C that also use source maps. So I believe it should be possible, but I, have, I don't have enough experience to tell you exactly how. Okay, so uh, we went through a full example using Ruby Wasm. So next, Opal Ruby, please start this project. GitHub.com forward slash Opal forward slash Opal. It's very simple. Um, so uh, for Opal Ruby, uh, Opal Ruby gets compiled on the server in the back end. So you have to say, uh, so add this uh, to gem file in a Rails 7 application, gem opal dash Rails. That will pull in Opal and then run this terminal command from the root directory of a Rails 7 app, uh, Rails G for generate, opal install. So that will install a bunch of basic files that are needed by a Rails application to uh, support opal. Next, uh, because we are gonna use opal Ruby instead of basic JavaScript, we're gonna delete intentionally the app JavaScript application JS file that comes with a Rails app from, from the get go. And uh, we're gonna replace it with another one. I'm gonna get into that in a second. Uh, add this HTML to a Rails view. This is the same exact stuff we did with the uh, Ruby Wasm. We just add a bunch of elements, a couple of elements. Finally, add this Ruby code to app assets JavaScript application.js.rb uh, because it compiles from Ruby code into JavaScript code. So that's why it's .js.rb, um, which is very cool. It's amazing. So. Now I can just add require opal in Ruby, require native. Uh, this is Ruby in the browser, so the put statement is the same. The document, uh, we pull it in a similar way. The, the syntax of opal is slightly different. You, you use double dollar, but it's very similar. You pull the document, you pull the window. Uh, you, and uh, usually, from my experience, Ruby Wasm code always executes after loading the DOM. Whereas in JavaScript with opal, you have to do the typical thing of on window load or, or document load. So that's why I added an add event listener DOM content, content loaded. Um, and then I add the same old code we added earlier. So we add get element by ID. So I also have a, the same API that gives me access to JavaScript elements. Uh, and then get element by ID for the button. And then on click, it's also the same exact thing. Add event listener for click. Uh, welcome to Opal Ruby this time. This is the same code. Update the inner HTML, window alert, same code, and we're done. So again, it's gonna give us this in the browser. This is Ruby in the browser, uh, in the browser console. Next, it's gonna, it's gonna give me the button, just like before. And then here, it's gonna say, welcome to Opal Ruby. And then finally, it's gonna fill in the element, uh, welcome to Opal Ruby. So uh, let's see a real version of this as well. So I'm gonna go to my code editor, and I'm gonna switch things around here. I'm gonna disable the Ruby Wasm code and enable the, the JavaScript code. Okay, this looks good. This is not important. This looks good. Okay, let's see if it's working now. Okay, good, so I see the button, so I click it. There you go, welcome to Opal Ruby. Okay, welcome to Opal Ruby. So that just proved that we got it working in Opal just the same way we got it working in Ruby Wasm. Um, okay, so that's, that's it. That's how you guys can get started. So feel free to play around uh, to your heart's content when you get home. Uh, next, we're gonna move into a very interesting topic, which is how do you share Ruby code between the front end and the back end? That's a very big selling point of using Ruby on the front end. So uh, let's start with Opal because the Opal way is a lot simpler. So if you haven't started the project, please start it on GitHub. But uh, okay, so here uh, first in, in the Rails app, add this to your config application RB. So add to your auto load paths, the directory app shared. So usually you have app models, app, con app controllers, app views. We're adding app shared. So shared is gonna contain any Ruby files that you wanna share between the back end and the front end. 
Uh, however, anything that's in app models, for example, or app controller is going to be backend only. Anything that's in, in the, under the JavaScript directory is going to be front end only. But if you need code that's shared between both, you put it here. And that addresses the security concern of, you know, I don't want to maybe expose all of my backend Ruby code to, to the front end. So that way you control what you expose. Only the files that are here are whitelisted to be available to the front end. Uh, next, I can do something similar for Opal. So Opal also supports an idea like this. Uh, so under config initializers assets RB in a Rail 7 app, in the same app, you add opal.append path, the same one that we just added. So again, app shared. So now both Rails and Opal have access to app shared as uh, an available Ruby uh, path. Uh, finally, Ruby files added to app shared can be required in Ruby from both Ruby on, the, on Rails backend and Opal Ruby frontend. So in both places, you can just say require in the Ruby file name. So let's see a demo. Uh, so before I go next, let's stay here and see the demo. So first, um, let's do this. Okay, I already have Opal enabled, so that's great. I'm gonna enable, uh, so okay, I have, let me show you something. Uh, tax calculator, oh, okay, there it is, app shared. Okay, so we have this file, app shared tax calculator. Let me open the content of it just to show you what it does. So this tax calculator, by the way, this is my own editor that I wrote in Ruby. I'm very happy to, to have built this editor. It supports all the features that I need. I'm very happy to be working in Ruby to build more Ruby. Uh, anyway, so we have this uh, tax calculator that will basically calculate tax the Canadian way, the, the most basic Canadian way. It's uh, multiply 15% by the price of a product. That's it. So uh, I want to reuse this on both the back end and the front end. So Except in Alberta. Exactly. That's why I said it's the most basic Canadian way, not the complete Canadian way. You got me. <laughs> uh, okay, so I added a few elements here that say calculate so, I mean, let me zoom in. Calculate tax for price. Uh, it'll take a price in, a ta in an input and then it'll give us the tax in an output. So first, let me show you how I'm executing it in the back end. I have here a welcomes controller that will use the ta ca tax calculator and execute calculations on the price parameter that, that it might receive from the, from the back end, on the back end, sorry, in the back end. So, First, let's do this. So let, let me refresh the page. So it just added this, these two elements. Actually, let, let me disable the previous elements because we don't need them anymore. So, um, okay, good. Now let's use the back, that Ruby code from the back end first, just to demonstrate using it from the back end. So I can say here, price equal 100. Boom. It just loaded the website from the back end with price 100 and it gave me, gave me the tax as $15. Um, now let's do it on the front end. So what I'll do is I'll go here and I'll type 50. Uh, sorry, I, I need to refresh the page. Sorry. Um, uh, and, oh yeah, and I need to just I need to remove the price from here as well. And let me let me make sure I enable the code that that is for tax calculations. It's here. I have it disabled, so I'm going to enable it in Opal. So this code is based, so okay, actually let me show you the code because it's very interesting. So on top, I added a new require statement. You just say require tax calculator. And then here, uh, in Rails you don't need to add it because Rails supports the idea of auto load, uh, which you can use in Opal if needed. But I don't have Opal, auto load enabled in Opal right now, so we're just using standard Ruby require, which is still very fascinating to be working on the front end. So I'm, I'm requiring the tax calculator, and then here I, I basically read the price input element, the tax div element, and then I, I take the price input, I read its value, I, compare it, I convert it to a, a float, and then here, this is exactly the same code I had on the back end. I use the tax calculator the same way. I construct it, and I pass it a price, and it gives me the tax, and then I load it into the inner HTML of, a, of the tax div. So now if I were to go back here, and refresh the page and then type in 100 here. Sorry, it's not working, I'm not sure why, just a second. Um, make sure I have everything 
enabled here correctly. Oops. I'd love to see what the console stands if you like, actually trying to like debug your front end version. Just a second. I think I know what happened. You're right. I think I know what happened. It's because I removed the previous elements which are getting access by, by code that I did not disable. There we go, it's working. So now this is the same exact calculator working on the front end, which is amazing. Like the same exact Ruby code is running the front end now. So there you go, that's it. We got it working both on the back end and the front end. So on to Ruby Wasm. So again, please start the project if you haven't already. I will be releasing the slides after the presentation, like in a few days or weeks, so don't worry too much about it if you don't catch it now, but it's better if you catch it now to avoid forgetting. So uh, add this to config application RB in a Rails app. This is exactly the same step we did with Opal. You just add app share to your auto load pass. Uh, next, this is not as straightforward. So as far as I know, I don't know what the Wasm way of sharing stuff in a Rails app from the back end to the front end but there are tricks to get around it. So you can use your asset, uh, you, you can basically sim link the app shared directory into a public directory. So that way it becomes available under public. That's what I did on my machine here locally to make it work. But obviously there are other ways of doing it. Like you can use your asset pipeline and uh, program extra configuration in it to copy files automatically on server deploy from app shared into public as well. So there are tricks to get around it. I, I don't know a basic Ruby way out of the box, but this is uh, today because Ruby Wasm is extremely new. It's, it's very, very new still. Opal Ruby is a bit older. It's actually mature. Opal Ruby came out around 2014 or maybe even earlier. So it's extremely mature. Whereas uh, Ruby Wasm is very new. It, it is relatively mature too, but it's still new. Uh, next, uh, what we do here is Ruby files could be added to app shared and they, they could be required from Ruby on Rails backend. However, on the, on the front end, again, it's not as straightforward. I cannot just add a require statement and it works. It doesn't work like that with Ruby Wasm. Instead, uh, anything I add to app shared uh, is gonna become pub uh, available under public Wasm shared. Uh, so then I can import it in a Ruby Wasm front end by adding this HTML script. So what I do is I add this script above the, the script of the main app. So I add wasm shared some file to require. So now uh, this will make it available as a pre-dependence, like a prerequisite for the app that I'm gonna run next. So if we were to go back now and make it work here, I'm gonna disable the Opal code, enable back the, the wasm code. And you can see here we have uh, this thing. I have tax calculator in a previous script uh, tag being included first. So that's the equivalent of a require statement in Ruby. Next, I include the, the main app. Uh, so now if I go to the main app, I'm gonna enable the code that is using the tax calculator. This code is exactly the same that was in Opal. It's almost exact. Yeah, it is the same. It is exactly the same code. Um, and now if I refresh the page, if I click here, just to prove it to you, we are in Wasm, not Opal anymore. So this proves to us that we're in Wasm. Now let's use this here using Ruby Wasm. There we go, works. Same Ruby code. Yep. So, so there you go. I just showed you a demo of reusing Ruby code on both the back end and the front end. By the way, uh, speaking of uh, this trick that I just showed you, uh, Sorry, so I mean, uh, so not the trick, sorry. Speaking of this script tag that I showed you, which we're including here ahead of the main script that uses it, I saw some, a blog post online by a Japanese developer who actually implemented require relative in Ruby Wasm by auto, uh, auto making Ajax calls to the server that will bring any file that you require. So meaning if, if I go here and then add, sorry here, example.ruby, and add require relative um, uh, tax calculator, right now this does nothing, it doesn't work. 
Wasm doesn't support to require relative out of the box. But I saw a, a Japanese developer blogged about how he implemented a version of this that will make Ajax calls to the server and will pull exactly the right file relative to the original file. But it won't cache. Uh, you might be right, yeah. Uh, but, but it's interesting, like what I'm trying to say is it's amazing people's creative way of coming up with solutions to problems. Uh, what I'm trying to say is more than likely in the near future, this will be a solved problem and it will not be a big deal. Eventually, probably people will be able to just say require relative and not have to do the trick of adding an extra, it's not a trick, but you know, the requirement to add an extra script tag. So, so again, this is a very new thing, Ruby Wasm, which is very exciting. And just like, you know, Rails was new 20 years ago, this is gonna, this, I'm pretty sure all the, the kinks will get ironed out eventually. But most of those kinks are already ironed out in Opal Ruby because it's much more mature. Okay, so before I go further, any questions? Awesome. So uh, now that we've gone through the basics of both Ruby Wasm and Opal Ruby, and then we saw how to reuse code between the back end and front end in both, let's get into more advanced Ruby techniques, Ruby in the browser techniques. So um, please start these projects on GitHub. Uh, Opal jQuery. So let's click on this just to see what it is, what, what it's about. So I already showed you example, an example of it earlier in a previous slide, but let me show you other examples. I mean, this is Opal jQuery code. Uh, whatever you did you, in, jQuery, in JavaScript using the dollar symbol here, you use pure Ruby code for it. Like you say element uh, and you say my class and here you just put a CSS expression. So basically you can write any jQuery code you could have written in J JavaScript using Ruby. This is how you do document ready uh, or document ready then if you prefer, uh, et cetera, et cetera, like document on click. This is the on way of doing it in Ruby. Of course, Ruby syntax is nicer because it gives you blocks. So th this is a very nice project for doing more advanced uh, programming in Opal Ruby. I've actually used it to build my own open source project, which I'm gonna talk about next. So let's go next. Um, so Opal jQuery is first. Next is Glimmer DSL for Opal. So this was an experimental project that I built about four years ago um, in Opal. Uh, it's a framework that lets you build a, a front end GUI using pure Ruby code. So instead of using HTML, you don't have to use HTML, you just use pure Ruby code. And given that Ruby lets you build DSLs, uh, we can take advantage of the metaprogramming facilities of Ruby and uh, build front end with pure Ruby. However, the, the, main, uh, uh, like the main idea behind this project was to auto webify Glimmer desktop apps. So Glimmer is actually a desktop uh, GUI library in Ruby that I've built uh, many years ago. Uh, which I still maintain today. And it's the library that I use to build my own code editor. Like this Gladiator, it's called Gladiator, is built using Glimmer. Uh, one, of the version, one of the libraries of Glimmer. Glimmer has about 10 libraries, so this is one of them. Uh, so I ended up building another one called Glimmer DSL for Opal that lets me basically take any app that I've already built on the desktop and run it in the browser with the same exact code without knowing HTML. I don't, like a developer doesn't have to know HTML. They could, they could just reuse the same Ruby code. So I'm gonna show you a quick example of this. So um, I have this um, Tetris version that I've implemented using Glimmer on the desktop. And this is the code of it, like the code, let me show you the pure Ruby code. See, it's uh, building, um, a shell is basically a window and it's got a Tetris menu bar, it's got a play field and a score lane. So to give you, and it's all a DSL, it's a very, uh, nice DSL that maps exactly to the things you see on the, in the GUI. So if I were to look at the game itself, this is the, the play field, this is the score lane, and the menu is here. Uh, so I mean, I can change the difficulty of the game, for example, and then if I say uh, unpause, this is Tetris built uh, in Ruby on the desktop. So it's just a, you know, the standard Tetris that you all know and hopefully love. <laughs> there you go. So. <coughs> This exact code that I just showed you here ran in Opal Ruby on the browser and generated browser front end GUI automatically. Let me show it to you. So if I were to, uh, let me enable that part 
in our example. So I'm going to re-enable Opal. Oops. Re-disable Wasm. Okay, and then here, I'm going to disable all of those and enable my Glimmer DSL for Opal app. And this is the, I'll show you the code in a second. This is basically GUI built uh, using a Ruby DSL. So it's not, um, the nice thing about Ruby DSLs is they're, is they're kind of like Lisp. Ruby is partially inspired by Lisp as far as I know. And this is kind of like code as data, data as code. So here I have the structure of the app. It's such, the shell is the window, meaning the browser tab. Uh, and I have a bunch of labels and uh, the labels have text. And they, there are buttons like hello arrow. If I click it, it'll launch an app. And here all I do is I require a Glimmer app that was written for the desktop originally. So let me show you uh, this in the browser now. So let's refresh this page. There it is. So this is the Glimmer DSL for Opal sample app. It gives me a whole list of samples. And uh, Tetris is here, so I'm just gonna click Tetris. Uh, it's gonna take a little bit to a while to load because Tetris has a lot of HTML elements, but there it is. It, doesn't, it didn't take too long, but Tetris, even on the desktop, it takes a bit, a bit of a while. But there it is. This is uh, just like the dust Tetris that I had on the desktop. So it's the same exact game, same exact Ruby code, like exactly the same Ruby code. You guys are seeing now working in the browser. Maybe the CSS needs a bit of adjustment. Like the nice thing is you can always skin. After you built, like you adapted it from a Ruby desktop app, you can skin it further with CSS if you want. But either way, I'm showing you how it works. It gave me the same panel, uh, same everything. So, I mean, the fonts might be a bit different between the browser and the desktop, but beyond that, it's the same game. It is the same exact logic. Uh, so, um, okay. So let's refresh and get out of it for now. So yeah, pretty impressive. I mean, I'm, to be honest, when I built that about three years ago, my mind was blown by Opal Ruby. I'm like, wow, Opal Ruby can do that. Like Opal Ruby is so complete. I was able to run an entire desktop app. It's a very complicated desktop. Like that Tetris is not a simple thing. And it ran in the browser, which is impressive. So I mean, that, that should give you confidence in Opal Ruby if you ever want to consider it for your projects. Uh, last but not least, Glimmer DSL for web is an upcoming gem with web-like Glimmer DSL. So oh, Glimmer DSL for Opal was an experiment where I wanted to run my desktop apps from Ruby into, in a browser using the same exact syntax. However, what if I want to appeal to front-end developers that already know HTML, CSS, and JavaScript very well, but they want to take advantage of all the niceties of Ruby, like blocks, like operator overloading, like the nice Ruby APIs, et cetera. Well, there's a new upcoming project that I just started. It's called Glimmer DSL for web that basically will give us a similar th thing to Glimmer DSL for Opal, except the idea was that it would start supporting Opal first and then eventually I'm, I want to support Wa Ruby Wasm as an option. So in the future, it should, my hope is that I would support also Ruby Wasm as just a configuration option. So if somebody wants, and, and both of them will have the same API, so if people uh, want to uh, use it with uh, Opal, they can use it with Opal. If they want to use it with Wasm, they just switch the configuration and it runs in Wasm. But the, different, the difference here in the syntax is that, as you can see here, I have a, a Ruby syntax that is more similar to HTML. So I have a div, I have a label that has a class, it has content, and here you get a div with a label with content. And uh, however, the nice thing is I can do more sophisticated thing using Ruby. So if I were to build, I can build a hello button as a, as a Glimmer web component and uh, it would have a counter and it's got markup here that's built in Ruby and it's got a div with text and button uh, and the inner text of the button will get updated using data binding. So I can take advantage of cool things I can do in Ruby like data binding where whenever the count uh, attribute on the counter gets updated, it will take the value, it will add this text to it, like click to increment, and it will insert it into the button uh, inner text. So this code is the type, in one line, I did so much. See this line? In a React app, you have to run, write a page to do the same thing. So this is the amazing thing that we could do in Ruby in the future uh, 
once this project gets completed, that, that will be very earth shattering, uh, in my opinion, like compared to what, what people do in JavaScript. Uh, so it'll give me this, basically it's gonna generate this markup, uh, and every time I press the button, the, the click to increment is gonna change. So here it changed to one. If I click it seven times, it changes to seven. And the beauty of it is the markup is very uh, declarative. It's not imperative. Uh, but also, if you want to mix logic into it, you can mix it directly because you're already in Ruby, and so which is an, an amazing thing that I cannot do in ERB or JSX or any other templating technology. So yeah, that that these are advanced options for Ruby in the browser. So last but not least, uh, what uh, what are the trade-offs between using JavaScript and Ruby in the browser? Uh, before I get into that, though, do, do you guys have any questions about like the advanced techniques of building Ruby apps in the browser? Oh, uh, it's going to start as Opal, and the hope is that it would eventually support Wasm as an option. Yes, yes. So you can still see what, yes. what is different. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, okay, so first of all, let's start with JavaScript. Now, JavaScript, unfortunately, cannot reuse back-end Ruby code. Uh, so that's, that's one of the trade-offs that you want to keep in mind versus Ruby in the browser. Uh, however, um, Oh yeah, also it has inflexible syntax that does not support declarative DSLs, forcing devs to rely on HTML, JSX templates. The reason why we use HTML is because JavaScript is not a nice language. If it was nice, we, like, we wouldn't use the HTML. Uh, like, it's funny, I saw a blog post a while ago that said Ruby is the best Lisp. What they mean is Ruby is kind of like Lisp in the sense that, that you can write your structure of the page as code as data, data as code in Ruby. Uh, whereas JavaScript is not, doesn't allow us to do what Lisp can do, so that's why we have to use templating languages. Uh, so that's another disadvantage. Uh, however, JavaScript browser debugging has a one-to-one -one mapping to the code, so that is one advantage to JavaScript. Uh, however, JavaScript does not enable full transfer of back-end Ruby skills, so if you have back-end Ruby skills, you still have to learn JavaScript on the front end if you're using JavaScript. Uh, however, JavaScript is natively supported by web browsers, meaning out of the get-go, the browser can interpret JavaScript right away, whereas with Ruby, uh, you need a back-end processing before you can interpret it. So, okay, let's get into Ruby in the browser. It can reuse back-end code, so that's a very good asset. Uh, it has a very flexible syntax with support for declarative DSLs, which is amazing because it enables a one, lang one language for structure and logic, which will minimize friction and improve productivity. Uh, browsing deb browser debugging by default does not have a one-to-one -one mapping to the code, uh, but with source maps, it comes closer to one-to-one -one mapping. Source maps gives you the illusion of having one-to-one -ma -one mapping to the code in the browser. Uh, it enables full transfer of back-end Ruby skills, which is great. Uh, it does require server compilation, however, in download. It is not native. It's not natively supported by browsers. I would hope that one day browsers would support the top 10 programming languages out of the box so that we don't have to even compile Ruby on the back end. But for, until then, even JavaScript with the later ECMAScript iterations used to get transpiled by Babel for a long time until browsers supported it. So, I mean, maybe they will support Ruby in the future, but for now, we have the option of using Opal Ruby or Ruby Wasm with back-end compilation. So I mean, in my opinion, these are uh, the trade-offs between the two. There are a few advantages to JavaScript, but they're dwarfed by the disadvantages. There are a lot more advantages to using Ruby in the browser. So um, before, I, before I leave, uh, what do, you, do you guys have any questions or other comments about this? Yeah, go ahead. Um, as far as I know, it does, yes. I believe web, web, uh, mobile browsers do support WASM too. And um, is it possible to import JavaScript libraries 
Yes, yes. Any JavaScript library is available in in Opal Ruby. In Wasm, I personally don't know how, what to do in order to reuse them, but I they should. There must be a, an indirect way to bring them over, but I personally don't know it because I'm very new to Ruby Wasm. But in Opal Ruby, it's a hundred percent yes. And uh, this is just one more thing: is is it possible because you had a problem with shared folder in Wasm? Is it possible to use import map? Do you think it, it can be a helpful way to do it? It's not a problem. It's it's not a real problem. It's just less convenient. That's it. It's not a problem. I'm able to import anything I want in Wasm as libraries, but I have to add extra script statements for them. You can automate it, yes. You can use an automated solution. Uh, uh, so regardless of whether it's import maps or something else, you could automate it. Like I mentioned, there's somebody who automated it by implementing require relative that would automatically call into the server and bring any extra files automatically for you so that you don't have to worry about it. But out of the box, uh, as far as I know, I have to do add the scripts myself. Uh, but before I go any further, uh, your previous question, it sounded like you had an answer to it. Uh, the one about... Um, the JavaScript video? No, no, JavaScript that I said. Oh, no, I'm just, just saying that the bridge, the bridge, yeah. bridge yeah. Mm -hmm. is common, you know, when you have a multilingual environment, and you could basically relay between the two is environments. Is this normal between CUB or MUB and C, for example? Right, right. So, I mean, I would, I would hope that the answer is yes, given the fact that it has the required JS library that gives you access to JavaScript at least. So, I would, I would hope that that it gives you access to any other libraries too. Data packet and then in one environment ship it to the other one and it comes back. It may depend what you're trying to do with it, also. Right. Okay. Attempting to use data structures from one. Because I see potential in having it in Stimulus instead of using JavaScript in Stimulus, you can use Wasm or Opal and you do the Stimulus. I think it's a good idea because then you have all everything integrated with Ruby. I mean, I'm, I'm personally a bigger fan of Opal just because I, I mentioned like it has a smaller download size and uh, it generally has nicer, like I can use require statements in Opal and stuff like that. So I generally personally would prefer to use Opal with Rails apps. Opal has very, very good support for Rails development right now. It ha the Opal Rails library is very mature uh, and, and very, uh, it follows the Rails way in general. Uh, Wasm, uh, really? Wasm works, but uh, I don't know of very nice ways for using it with Rails yet, but maybe you, you can look into them and maybe you can build your own library that would facilitate using it with Rails yeah. more simply. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, Ruby Wasm is very new still. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into the summary. Uh, so we started by having Matt, uh, we, we watched Matt's, Matt's, the creator of Ruby, mention how Ruby in the browser is a possibility or is possibly the future of Ruby. Uh, Try Ruby Playground is, uh, you know, the Ruby environment that is available on rubylang.org that allowed us to experiment with both Ruby Wasm and Opal Ruby. Uh, we went over the reasons for why, why we should consider Ruby in the browser. Uh, we talked about the available options and trade-offs for Ruby in the browser, how to get started with Ruby in the browser, uh, whether it's Ruby Wasm or Opal Ruby. We talked about how to share code between the, the front end and the back end. And then we went through some advanced Ruby in the browser techniques like Opal jQuery, like Glimmer DSL for Opal. Uh, that, that's a very advanced framework built on top of Opal and uh, the upcoming Glimmer DSL for web, which I hope you've started on GitHub. And if you haven't, please start it after the presentation. Um, JavaScript versus Ruby uh, trade-offs. And that's about it. Uh, if you, uh, before we move on to the Q&A part, I wanna mention if you wanna continue your learning, um, I know some of you check this out. So there's an intermediate Opal app blog post that, I writ uh, that I've written a while ago. It's called Using Opal Ruby with Rails 7. Uh, I know you've taken a look at it. It's, a, it's basically a, a guide that shows you how to build 
more intermediate apps in Opal, including like I built a, a baseball animated baseball card application that lets you build your own baseball card for any baseball MLB player and then see an animation uh, in a GIF using GIF. Um, and then there's an intermediate Opal app GitHub project called Baseball Cards, which is the app that got built in that blog post. One thing I do want to warn you though, is this blog post was written about two or three years ago. So it's slightly, it's a bit outdated. Unfortunately, the link that lets you download official MLB uh, team logos doesn't work anymore. You need to, I, I need to update it. So, but, but it generally works though. And maybe you, it's an open source project. Everything open source is, is a, a community effort. So I encourage everybody to contribute. If you want to fix it, you're welcome to fix it and submit uh, and like send me an email with a patch or something or submit it on GitHub. Uh, and please start the project if you haven't or start it when I, when I share the slides. Uh, and uh, otherwise we are hiring at Lexop. We're looking for a senior full stack developers. So if you are a senior full stack developer that's looking for a job or you know somebody, please, please direct them our way. Uh, we have a very, very uh, uh, productive software engineering environment at, at Lexop uh, because we, we have very lean processes, kind of like inspired by the Toyota, Toyota lean processes. And also um, we make sure to not just deliver direct value to customers, but also indirectly deliver value to customers by maintaining our code quality uh, to keep it of the highest quality. Like we do a lot of tech debt work basically as part of our main work that, that delivers work, uh, sorry, value to customers, which is a very unique thing that I've only seen at Lexop in a very few companies. So I highly encourage you to work for us if you are looking for a job or if you know somebody, please direct them our way. Um, so that's it. Uh, thank you everybody. Let's go through the Q&A phase. Any other questions? You guys, I gave you a lot of Q&A uh, periods during the talk, so maybe you guys asked all the questions you had, but if you have any, you're welcome to ask me more questions. How do your times compare between Opal and the ML one times? It's probably pretty skewed, but if you're doing like really scaled up to adapt to many, many files, how do your times look like between the two? Um, I, I cannot answer your question um, because I personally, so, I built uh, mostly single page apps, kind of like the Tetris that I just showed you, and all of them generally run fast, uh, very fast in Opal, so I haven't had any issues with it. Um, so the transformation is what, 10 seconds, or is it faster? Um, uh, is the Tetris thing, is the particle wrong? The translation? Or is it no, that wasn't the, the transformation. No, that, that was the execution. That was the execution because it generates many, many, uh, it, it generates like 2,000 objects in memory. Sorry, 2,000 elements oh, or something crazy like, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Which have, even in the desktop version, it takes a bit while. Usually games will give you a loading screen yeah. when you load. Yeah. I, my, my mistake is I did not add a loading screen to that one. I probably should. It, sh it shouldn't be that I'm hard. I'm just curious what part but, of the um, But, uh, in my experience, I, I didn't experience anything that different from when we used to compile ECMAScript with, with Babel. Okay. Like, so rule of thumb, not long enough. Not that different from, not, not, not different from Babel, not slower, for, for sure not slower than Babel in my experience. But uh, I, yeah, my, I would say I have a lot of experience, but it's all focused on single page apps like that Tetris. So I'm, um, I wouldn't say I have a lot of uh, professional experience using it on an app with many, many web pages. Yeah. So that's the reason I couldn't answer your question. But, but, it's generally it's not but I personally haven't to, had any bad experience with it. It's not like slow enough to annoy you, right? No, no, not at all. No, that, that I would say that the benefits way outweigh the costs in my experience. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. One of the advantages of using JavaScript is having the asynchronous behavior. Do you think it is possible to have something because I think it's in Opal you can't have it by R Ruby by gives Ruby you a lot of APIs Opal. for the asynchronous stuff as well. Like Opal Ruby, I know gives you APIs to to be able to do any asynchronous stuff you could do in JavaScript in Ruby. Okay. As far as I know. But, but I, I don't think that Wasm can do this because it's pure in Ruby and. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Right, yeah. right, right. It's a single thread, right? Um, yeah, I I don't know much about that in Wasm. 
I know that Opal Ruby can take advantage of web workers. Just, just like any JavaScript code, you could use web workers to delegate work to multiple threads mm -hmm. uh, in the back end, in the background, sorry. So I know Opal Ruby supports it for sure, but in, in fact, the Try Ruby website is written using web workers with, with uh, Opal Ruby. Um, Ruby Wasm, I, I, I don't know what the answer to that question is in it. Uh, but uh, I'm sure you could do your own research on Wasm in general and learn more about it after the talk. Um, okay, so that should conclude the presentation and begin the networking time. You guys are, of course, welcome to ask me any questions during the networking time, because sometimes questions don't come up right away. Uh, but yeah, thank you everybody for your attendance and participation.